In this video, I'm gonna go over my list of 25 mistakes that new Pandas users often make. In most of these cases, the code will still run, but there's a better way to implement the same functionality. These mistakes will also be a dead giveaway to anyone reading your code that you're new to the library. Number one, writing to a CSV with an unnecessary index. This mistake is often made when the pandas data frame index contains no valuable information. By default, when writing to CSV, this will include the index without a column header name. This mistake becomes more obvious when the same CSV is read in and an unnamed zero column is included. You can avoid this mistake by setting index equals to false when saving to CSV, or alternatively, setting an index column when reading in the CSV that contains an unnamed index. Number two, using column names that include spaces. At first glance, using column names with spaces may be seen as a good thing. However, there are many issues that arise when you use column names that include spaces. One of the biggest being that you lose the ability to access the column using dot syntax. It's preferable to use underscores in place of spaces in column names. And you can see here, because we've done so, you can access this column using the dot syntax. It also makes querying these columns much easier. Number three, not leveraging the query method. Often you want to filter your data frame to a subset. There's nothing wrong with the syntax chosen here. However, many new users are unaware that you can write powerful queries using the dot query method. This becomes especially helpful the more complex your query criteria becomes. Number four, using string methods to formulate your query strings. Many times you have a variable that you want to query on. It's common then to see these string queries created manually, either by using f strings or by concatenating strings. But this isn't necessary because pandas queries can access external variables by simply using the at symbol before the variable name. Number five, using in place equals true. Now I can understand how this one would be confusing to new users. As many built-in methods like fill in a and reset index have the in place option. Setting in place to true will overwrite the data frame with the changes. However, using in place is generally frowned upon and the Pandas core developers even plan to remove this functionality altogether. It's better to instead explicitly overwrite with the modifications. Number six, iterating over the rows in a data frame when vectorization is an option. This is a big one that you see a lot with new users of Pandas. In this example, if we wanted to determine the rows that contain a year greater than 2000, we could iterate over each year. However, it's much more preferable to use vectorized functions. Here, the greater than can be applied to the entire year column and stored as a result. Number seven, using the apply method when vectorization is an option. The apply method allows you to run any function or cross an axis of your data frame. While this is usually better than iterating over each row in the data frame, it's still preferable to use vectorized functions when possible. For instance, here we're creating a new column which squares the year value. And here we have the vectorized version where we applied the square to the entire array. This is not only cleaner, but will run faster. Number eight, treating a slice of a data frame as if it were a new data frame. In this example, we're filtering our data frame for times under 10 and storing this as DF fast. However, when we modify this new data frame, we will see a set with copy warning. This warning occurs because our new modifications are actually being applied to a slice of our old data frame. So when you do wanna create a new data frame based on a subset of your initial data frame, it's best to use the copy method. This by default will create a deep copy and any edits to your new data frame will not impact the initial data frame. Number nine, creating multiple intermediate data frames when making transformations. It's not uncommon to see code like this where each step of the process is then written to a new data frame variable. There are many reasons why this is not ideal. It's instead encouraged to use chaining commands where all the transformations are applied once. Number 10, not properly setting column D types. Each column in a pandas data frame has a specific data type. When reading in data, pandas will try its best to parse these types. However, as you can see here, this date column is represented as an object. In many instances, you'll have to manually set these D types. In this case, we could correctly set this column to a date time format by using parse dates within read CSV. Alternatively, we could manually set this D type 
using the pandas to date time method. Number 11, using the string value instead of a boolean. In this case, we've made a new column called sub 10, which is yes when the time value is less than 10. Instead of using text to represent something that could be true or false, you should cast these as a boolean value. This can be done when you create the column, or if your data set already has values like this, you can map them to true or false. Number 12, not leveraging pandas built-in plotting methods. Often, you'll find yourself in a situation where you want to make a quick plot of the data in your pandas data frame. This can be done by creating a matplotlib subplot and plotting the data manually. Pandas already has a lot of this functionality built into its plot method. Number 13, manually applying string methods. Do you have a column that contains string values and you want to apply a string method like uppercase? You might think this is a situation where you need to apply the uppercase method across the column. Pandas actually has string methods where you can apply any string method to the entire array just by calling str and then your command, in this case upper. Number 14, repeating commonly used data transformations. In this example, we're reading in one data set, performing a number of transformations to it, and then doing the exact same thing to a different data frame. It's generally best practice to not repeat code unless you need to, especially when creating data pipelines, it's preferred to write a function for that pipeline, which you then can apply to each data frame. Not only does this make your code easier to read, but it ensures that the same processing is done identically on both data frames. Number 15, manually renaming columns. It is possible to rename columns by providing a list of new names. The preferred and much cleaner way to do this is to use the rename method and provide a dictionary to the columns variable with the old and new names. Number 16, aggregating by groups manually. In this case, we have a data set with both men's and women's times, and we want to return the lowest men's and women's value. It's possible to filter on this grouping column and calculate the minimum value for each. This is exactly what the group by method is for. It allows you to select a column or columns to group the data on, and then any aggregations will be done to those groups independently. Number 17, looping over the rows in a data frame to create aggregates. Similar to the last mistake, when creating multiple group by aggregates, you'll see code that iterates over each row in the data frame, storing the results after each iteration. The same results can be calculated by a simple group by aggregation. Grouping this way also allows you to provide multiple ways to aggregate the data, in this case, mean and count but you can also provide things like maximum, minimum, and standard deviation. Number 18, using a loop to calculate how a value changes. In this example, we're calculating the percent change and the difference between the time columns in each row of the data frame. You might be catching on to a trend now, but there's actually a built-in function for doing things like this. You can use the percent change and diff methods to calculate the change in this pandas series. Number 19, saving large data sets as CSVs. When working with pandas, eventually you'll get to the point where you need to save the data to disk. CSV is one of the most common file formats to save data, but especially with large data sets, this can be very slow and take up a lot of space on your hard disk. Pandas has built-in methods to save to many different file types, including Parquet, Feather, and Pickle files. These file formats also retain the data types of your data frame, which saves you from having to set them manually when reading in the file. Number 20, switching to Excel for conditional formatting. New Pandas users may find themselves switching back to Excel to do things like conditional formatting. You might be surprised to know that Pandas data frames have a style attribute, which allows you to do extensive formatting to your data frame when you display it as HTML. This type of styling can be extremely powerful and covers almost anything you would want to do in Excel. Number 21, not setting suffixes when merging two data frames. When merging two data frames on a specific column or columns, any columns that appear in both data frames but are not being used to merge will be given the default underscore X and Y suffixes. By explicitly stating the suffixes in your merge, you can more easily track what these columns are later in your data processing. Number 22, 
manually checking after merging two data frames. There may be cases when you're merging two data frames and want to confirm that the merge is a one-to-one -one match. You can check for this by comparing the lengths of the merged data frame with the initial data frame. Pandas merge has a validate parameter which will automatically check for different merge types. This will throw a merge error if the validation fails. Number 23. Stacking chained commands into one line of code. Method chaining is a great feature in Pandas, but your code can get really unreadable if it's all in one line. By wrapping your expression in parentheses, you can split your code so that each line has one component of the expression. This makes it a lot more readable. Number 24, not using categorical data types. In this example, we have a grouping column which contains only two potential values. Instead of storing columns like this as a string object, it's better to store them as a categorical data type. Categorical data types take up less space in memory and can make operations much faster on large data sets. Number 25, creating duplicated columns. This issue can arise when concatenating two data frames. As you can see here, the year column appears twice in this data frame. And if you don't know this is possible, this can be really confusing and hard to debug. Pandas does have a flag that can be set, which will alert you when duplicate labels occur. You can also solve this problem by using this line of code, which will check for duplicated columns and remove them. Thanks for watching this video. If there are any mistakes that I missed, please let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.